any scientist that looks into the, to the research or the lack of research uh, on the, the safety of genetically engineered food comes to the conclusion that um, these foods should not be on the market. They need another decade or two of uh, research. Monsanto is the company that told us that PCBs were safe. They were convicted of actually poisoning people in their town next to the PCB factory and fined $700 million. They told us that Agent Orange was safe. They told us that DDT was safe. And now they're in charge of telling us if their own genetically modified foods are safe. Because the FDA doesn't require a single safety study, they leave it to Monsanto. I know Monsanto, as one of the officials of the organization said, we're here to make money. And that's not just Monsanto, that's a lot of food industries. Their job is to make money for the investor. Unfortunately, that becomes the highest priority thought in their minds. Make money, make money, make money. They're not actually making products to make health, they're making money. And so they tend to overlook uh, the health consequences. I think that is a ridiculous sort of approach the problem. There should be some responsibility being, being assumed by the producer that when they're producing food, they have a reasonably good assurance that it's a good quality product. That should be the highest priority thing. And then if they can make money with that, fine and dandy. But unfortunately, it's usually the other way around. People in this sort of business are looking for opportunities to make money first priority. And then in this case, maybe letting somebody else worry about the health consequences, maybe even the public. And I, I think we have it upside down. That is simply upside down. Why did the FDA abdicate their responsibility to protect us? The White House had instructed the FDA to promote biotechnology under the first Bush administration. And so the FDA created a new position for Michael Taylor, Monsanto's former attorney. So Michael Taylor was in charge of policy at the FDA when this GMO policy was created, and then he became Monsanto's vice president, and under the Obama administration, was put back in the FDA as the U.S. food safety czar. In reality, the overwhelming consensus among the scientists at the FDA were not only that GMOs were different, but that they were inherently dangerous, that they might create allergies, toxins, new diseases, and nutritional problems. They had urged their superiors to require long-term study, and when they saw drafts of the policy coming back to them, they were angry and urged their political appointees to change course. But Michael Taylor and the political appointees ignored the science, ignored the scientists, denied the existence of their concerns, and set forth a policy that allowed GMOs to be put on the market in a way that, that creates unprecedented risk for human beings and the environment. The FDA is composed of smart people, but they're smart people with a conflict of interest. They're smart people who make their decisions based on what will support their financial needs or their academic needs, not what makes scientific sense. What you can do with GMOs is basically engineer food in ways that make it most profitable from the company's perspective. But from the company's perspective, whatever negative aspects of that might exist are simply irrelevant. And more than being irrelevant, the company is motivated to try to suppress knowledge about those negative aspects. The company is motivated to try to suppress government attempts to regulate in relation to those negative aspects. Uh, the company is motivated to try to infiltrate government and lobby government. I mean, when you look at um, uh, the Clinton administration, Bush Sr., Bush Jr., and Obama, uh, you look at um, various high-ranking positions in the administrations of all of those presidents, you find people who have worked for Monsanto. Most people don't realize that Monsanto has been around for about a century. They've acquired lots of resources, and they are very clever and sophisticated. They know how the game works. They understand lobbying. They understand bribery. They have been effective at essentially stacking the political structure, the federal regulatory agencies in their favor to the point 
that it's almost physically impossible to pass any type of federal regulations or legislation because the people who make those choices are, are, have been in the revolving door of Monsanto. They either previously worked for them or they're paid consultants for them. The governments now, wherever they are, are dependent on corporations. Who are these governments? Who are these companies, corporations? Telling people what to do, what to eat, what to feed their children. We are people, we're the children of God. We have constitutions, we have our constitutional rights to eat and feed our families that nature produces. They say, no, we don't have that right. In fact, we're going to force that on you. Not a single human being on earth gets up and says, boy, I can't wait to go to the supermarket and buy a GMO food. And why is that? That's because after 30 years and hundreds of billions of dollars of public and private investment, they haven't been able to come up with one thing in this food that actually helps the consumer. No better taste, no lower price, no more nutrition, nothing, zip, zero, nada. 85% of all the genetically engineered crops in this country and around the world are designed so you can soak them with weed killers, toxic herbicides. And who are the big companies that do this? Come on, you know who they are. Monsanto, anybody, what, who else? DuPont, Dow Chemical, Syngenta, Bayer. What, what kind of companies are these? Chemical companies. As the chemical seed package has spread, and now with genetically engineered seed, seed that originally was free in India because it belonged to the farmers, or was low cost because it was released from the public sector universities that did seed breeding. In the genetic engineering revolution, these seeds are now patented property of one corporation called Monsanto. They take genetic material, either DNA or RNA, and insert it using very sophisticated techniques and create an artificial life form, a transgenic species that is impossible to reproduce in nature because the reproductive organs don't match. And as a result, once this form is created, here's the danger. It can cross-pollinate, it can contaminate the traditional crops. Percy Schmeiser was a farmer in Canada who was contaminated by Monsanto's genetically modified seed. Well, he realized he'd been contaminated because he used some of this herbicide to kill off weeds around utility poles on his property. When he saw some of the seed uh, did not die from the application of glyphosate, he knew it must be genetically modified. Well, he didn't do anything to purge his property of that contaminated seed. It would actually take three years of taking your crops out of use before you could completely purge them of the genetically modified seed. He decided he didn't want to do that because that would be costly. So he saved his seed for planting the following year. And Monsanto said, well, you now knew that you had genetically modified seed. You saved it for planting a second year. That's infringement. They sued him for patent infringement. It went all the way up to the Canadian Supreme Court. And although they found that technically he did infringe their patent, they awarded Monsanto no damages. Both in Canada and the United States, hundreds of farmers have been totally bankrupt, lost their farms and so on through lawsuits by Monsanto. So there's a real fear. Now we call it the new fear, a fear culture amongst farmers where a corporation now through the rights of patents on, on a gene have, uh, which is inserted into a seed to make it resistant to a chemical or whatever, is that they lose their rights to use their own seeds or plants. So it's total control eventually that farmers have to go back to a corporation like Monsanto each year to buy their seed they're, as because they're no longer allowed to use their own seeds. As a victim, you basically have to pay for the, your lawsuit, your damages, and so on. So farmers become victims because, and they have done nothing wrong because they were contaminated by a neighbor, by whatever means, by pollen flow, by seeds blown in the wind, transportation, and so on. So it doesn't matter how it happens. If you are contaminated, it's over and it's over. It's inevitable that someone who does not want to use their seed will become contaminated. Even the United States National Organic Program standards acknowledge this. When they say you won't lose your organic certification if you're contaminated up to a certain percentage as long as you take efforts to try to avoid that contamination. 
Monsanto has said that it's the responsibility of an organic farmer to use large portions of their own property to set up buffer zones to try to decrease the likelihood that they'll be contaminated by their neighbors. But that's quite perverse when it's their seed that's the new entrant into the neighborhood. In the mid-90s, the UK government gave about three million bucks to a scientist to figure out how to test for the safety of GMOs. That scientist was Dr. Arpad Pustai, the world's leading expert in his field. He worked at the top nutritional research laboratory in the UK, one of the best in the world. He had about 20 or 30 researchers working with him in three different institutes, and his protocols that he was designing were supposed to be implemented into EU law as requirements for the safety assessments of any GMOs to be introduced into Europe. He took a potato that was genetically engineered to produce an insecticide and fed one group of rats the genetically engineered potato. He fed another group of rats natural potatoes and a third group of rats natural potatoes plus their meal was spiked with the same insecticide that the GM potato was engineered to produce. So you have GM potato, natural potato, and natural potato plus an insecticide and all three had a completed balanced diet as well. We measured all sorts of things. Growth, for example, how these young animals were growing, uh, what happened to their inside, and what happened to their immune system. And uh, it became clear uh, that uh, the GM had a, a slower growth. It had uh, problems with uh, internal uh, development of its organs and it certainly uh, knocked out the immune system. Only the rats that ate the GM potato got sick. They had potentially precancerous cell growth in their digestive tract, smaller brains, livers, and testicles, partial atrophy of the liver, damaged immune system in 10 days. What was the cause of that damage? It was not the insecticide because the group eating the insecticide did not have the problem. It was understood that it was the process of genetic engineering itself and the unpredicted side effects that caused this profound damage to every system and organ study. He shared his concerns about GMOs and was a hero for about two days at his prestigious institute. The press was going wild. Here was a main scientist who was saying that we should not treat the people as guinea pigs and that he personally wouldn't eat GMOs from what he understood. The director of his institute received two phone calls from the UK Prime Minister's office. The next day, Dr. Arpad Pustai was fired from his job after 35 years, silenced with threats of a lawsuit. His team was disbanded. They never implemented the protocols. Instead, a campaign was launched to destroy his reputation in order to promote and protect the reputation of biotechnology. We do have uh, all the methods available for testing, testing the safety of, uh, of uh, GM uh, crops. It will be unforgiven by uh, humanity if we don't uh, do it but use them as our guinea pigs. We have a, a closing window of opportunity that's closing very rapidly. And California, we've been able to implement this citizen's ballot initiative, which and you may wonder why it's so important to pass in California. Well, California is the eighth largest economy in the world. If the citizen's ballot initiative is successful in California because of its size and its influence in the rest of the uh, national economy, it will be logistically impractical for, for most food manufacturers to create two labeling systems. And most will choose to exclude it in the soda industry. Pepsi was required to label a carcinogen. And rather than label that, put that label on uh, that item on their label, they chose to remove it. And this is exactly what's happened in, in Europe. And in fact, 49 other countries in the world where, where labeling is required. Russia, the entire European Union, and even China require this. And by just requiring the labeling, it tends to disappear from the food supply.